The first speaker of the session this morning is going to be uh, Corey Glover from uh, BYU, and he'll be talking about non-backtracking spectrum of graphs. Awesome. Um, so like Carolyn said, um, I'm Corey from BYU, and this is work that's done with my advisor, Dr. Kempton. Um, and so I want to start off with some definitions. So first off, let's go through the definition of what a random walk on a graph is. So we're going to say that we have a random walk across our graph where we have a collection of vertices where the i plus one vertex is chosen uniformly at random from the neighbors of the i vertex. So just your standard random walk. But based on the title of this presentation, we aren't looking at random walks. We want to think about non-backtracking random walks. And so we say we have a non-backtracking random walk um, is a walk across a graph where the ith plus one vertex is chosen uniformly at random from the set of neighbors of the ith vertex with the exception of the i minus one vertex. So what do I mean by that? If I'm at vertex A and I travel to vertex B, and then my next step is chosen uniformly at random from the neighbors of B with the exception of A. So I can't go where I just was. That doesn't mean I can't end up at A later. I just can't end up at A if I was just at A. And so we call this kind of ran or this kind of random walk a non-backtracking random walk. Now, it's clear a random walk is a Markov process, but a non-backtracking random walk is not, right? To know where we're going, we need to know where we are and where we just were. So we're going to look at a formulation of the non-backtracking random walk where we can kind of turn this into a Markov process. And we're going to do that using the non-backtracking matrix. So the main idea of this is I take my graph. So here I have a C4. And we look at any of the directed edges. And we're going to lift all those directed edges to two, or sorry, all these undirected edges in the two directed edges. So if this is node A and this is node B, and I have an edge between A and B, I'm going to create two edges, a directed edge from A to B and a directed edge from B to A. And now we're going to think of these directed edges as the nodes of a new graph. So it's going to be a graph with two M nodes, where M is the number of edges in my regular graph. And we say these edges are connected if they satisfy two conditions. One, they point into each other. They're connected in the natural sense. So a, the directed edge A to B would connect to B to C, let's say. But it also satisfies the condition that it doesn't backtrack. So in our case, the edge A to B will not connect to B to A because that edge would backtrack to where we just were. And so we can then encapsulate this in a matrix, um, which we're going to call B. And this B is going to be like an adjacency matrix on these directed edges. And the graph generated by B, we can think of a random walk on that graph. And that's going to be equivalent to a non-backtracking random walk on our original graph G. So the nice thing is now we gain back all these Markov properties. Bad thing is the graph generated by B is really, really big now. But we do gain back those properties. And it's a lot easier to understand the non-backtracking random walk with this new graph generated by B. So the purpose of this presentation is to going to be to examine this non-backtracking matrix, particularly the spectrum of the non-backtracking matrix, what we can learn about that. So what we, the big result about this thus far is Ihara's theorem. So the idea is if we have our graph G and the adjacency matrix and the degree matrix of said graph, then the characteristic polynomial of the non-backtracking matrix is equal to this expression. So what does this expression tell us? Well, we're guaranteed that we're going to have m minus n, ones and minus ones, where m is the number of edges in our graph, n is the number of nodes. And then the rest of our eigenvalues are going to come from this determinant expression. So for most of this talk, we're going to focus on this determinant expression. Because if we understand the determinant expression, then from a Horace theorem, we understand the spectrum of B. Um, and this is you know, a little bit more manageable than looking at just B itself. So we also know you can plug in a regular graph. So this D minus I then becomes um, an identity matrix times some scalar. And this can simplify really nicely. So in the case of a D regular graph, 
we can get explicitly what the eigenvalues of our non-backtracking matrix are. We get our plus and minus ones, and then all the other eigenvalues are going to satisfy this equation where the lambda i's are the eigenvalues of our adjacency matrix. So we have this relation between the adjacency matrix and the non-backtracking matrix. We're gonna see later in a talk an expression very similar to this um, that's gonna pop out in the irregular case. Um, okay, so now to go to the irregular case, there's a couple tools I wanna to grab. The first is gonna be this matrix K. K is gonna be a block matrix where we have an adjacency matrix at the top left, a degree matrix minus an identity in the top right, negative identity in a zero block. And it's clear just through simple calculation that the characteristic polynomial of K is this determinant expression from Ihara's theorem. So we're gonna use this matrix K to understand the spectrum of B because of the characteristic polynomial of K. And we're also going to use some other operators. Um, here we have S, T, and tau. So S is going to be our node to edge operator. Um, it's going to take in a node and it's going to have a one if that node is being pointed to by a directed edge. Um, similarly, T is going to be our edge to node operator. We're going to have um, our edge and they're going to have a one if that edge is coming out of a certain node. And then tau is our backtracking operator. So it's directed edge by directed edge, and there's a one if two directed edges backtrack each other. And we can use these to define a lot of the matrices we care about. For example, the non-backtracking matrix is going to be st minus tau, which makes sense because st will show all of our connected edges, and then tau subtracts off the backtracking ones. Similarly, you can get the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. And using these S and T's and tau's, we can actually relate that K matrix I just defined before and our non-backtracking matrix. It turns out the non-backtracking matrix times this ST transpose block is equal to ST transpose times K. So we can kind of relate these two back and forth. All right, so now we can actually get into the results now that we have all the definitions we need. So the first result that we're going to do is create a decomposition of B of sorts that's going to show us more explicitly the eigenvalues of B. So what I mean by that, we're going to try to mirror something that Lubetsky and Paris did in 2010. Um, and they did this for D regular graphs. And so they showed that B, our non-backtracking matrix, is unitarily similar to this block diagonal matrix. Now this block diagonal matrix, it has our spectral radius, D minus one, has all of our negative ones and plus ones that are in the spectrum from Ihara's theorem. And then all the rest of our eigenvalues can be found inside either this D minus one or these blocks where the diagonals of these blocks are the, um, that square root equation that we had um, from the D regular graph. And so we're able to see really clearly what these eigenvalues are of B looking at this block diagonal matrix. We're gonna do something similar and now it's not quite as pretty because it's irregular, um, but we can take the non-backtracking matrix in the irregular case and relate it to this block diagonal matrix where we have all the eigenvalues that are coming from K and then we have our ones and our minus ones. And this relation is being done with this block matrix X, where X is built from an ST transpose, and that's relating B with K. And then this R, and this R is just um, linearly independent columns coming from the eigenspaces of one and negative one, respectively. Um, and the proof of this is not difficult. It's really just algebraic manipulation, um, just mul matrix multiplying things out, and then it, you show that both sides are equal. Okay, so we have this decomposition. Now let's zoom in a little bit on the eigenvalues of K. So we have some properties of K. Um, it turns out every eigenvalue eigenvector pair of K is of this form, mu and then negative mu y, y, where y is some like block vector. We're always guaranteed that one is in the spectrum of K and the algebraic multiplicity of one is equal to the number of connected components. Um, we have that the nullity of K is the number of degree one vertices. And if K happens to be invertible, we can see what the inverse is. So I'm gonna focus on this first property. If we write out this first property, what it would look like, 
we would get the following. We would take our matrix K, multiply it by the eigenvector, and we can solve things a little bit to get this nice little expression. Now, it's not quite a quadratic because it's a vector, but it's close. So to make it a true quadratic, we're going to left multiply everything by an eigenvector of our adjacency matrix. So take an eigen or an eigenvalue of our adjacency matrix and its associated eigenvector. If we assume that x transpose y does not equal 0, and then we just scale x transpose y that equals 1, when we left multiply by x transpose, we get this expression, which is now like a true quadratic. And we can use the quadratic formula to solve for the value of mu, which is the eigenvalue of k. So now we can relate the spectrum of k with the spectrum of a. Now, I want to note this doesn't get you the entire spectrum of k, because we don't know that x transpose y is always equal to 0. We don't know that k is diagonalizable, so we might have issues with the multiplicities of geometric algebraic, have issues there going on. But if things work out nicely, we could get at least some of them. So we're going to use this expression to actually put a bound on the spectral radius of k in terms of the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix. So the way we're going to do this, first we need the fact that our non-backtracking matrix is irreducible. Um, it turns out that that happens when g is a connected graph, um, that's not a cycle, and the minimum degree of every node is at least two. In that case, we get that b is irreducible. Um, we also get, in the case that B is irreducible, so these same conditions, then the spectral radius of A is guaranteed to be strictly greater than 1. And there's going to be a positive vector Y satisfying this eigenvector eigenvalue um, equation with K. Um, I'm not going to go through the proof of this lemma, but if people have questions about it, I do have just like a sketch of it that I can go through later in the Q&A. Um, but with these two conditions, we can get to our big result. And this is our bound on the spectral radius of K and in turn the spectral radius of B, our non-backtracking matrix. So the idea to get this result, to get this bound, what we're going to do is we take our eigenvector, eigenvalue pair of the spectral radius of our adjacency matrix, and similarly for the spectral radius of K, and we know because this y is always strictly positive, we are guaranteed that x transpose y does not equal 0. So then because x transpose y does not equal 0, we can use this nifty little equation that we made. And then at that point, we can, we're looking at the spectral radius. So we can put in for all these lambdas, we put in the spectral radius of a. And then we can bound this degree minus 1 with this minimum degree giving us this full bound on the spectral radius of the non-backtracking matrix. So this is really nice because now if we understand what the spectral radius of our adjacency matrix is, it can give us a little bit more intuition on what's happening in our non-backtracking matrix and its spectrum. Um, and then we also, so we know a lot of bounds already on the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix. Um, we chose to plug in one um, by Dawson Kumar. Um, and this, we just plugged in the bound on the spectral radius of A, and that gives us a new bound on the spectral radius of B in terms of the number of edges and the number of nodes in our graph. All right, so at this point, we know a little bit more about the top of the spectrum of B. Um, what about the bottom? It turns out we can also bound the bottom of the spectrum of B. Um, we can show that the modulus of every eigenvalue is at least one. Um, the way we do this is really similar to what we did before. Um, that equation we had where we left multiplied by x transpose, you can just left multiply it by y transpose and you get a similar expression, um, except now you have these y transposes rather than x transposes. And then we just break it into cases based on the discriminant of the square root. So if the discriminant is um, either zero or negative, um, we, it turns out to just simplify down to showing that the minimum degree is at least two and it falls out pretty quick. Um, if it's positive, you need that the minimum degree is at least two and a Laplacian shows up in some algebraic manipulation and from the positive semi-definiteness of the Laplacian, we get the result that we want. So what have we seen? We can use K to understand the spectrum of B. 
um, we can see that B is related to some block diagonal matrix, kind of more explicitly showing what the spectrum looks like. And then we can use K to bound our spectral radius of B. Um, and so things we want to do is see if we can figure out anything about the spectral gap of B. Um, and then as well, we're trying to do the same thing with the transition probability matrices, because if we can relate those two spectrums, we can understand how to relate the random walk and the non backtracking random walk a little bit more. So that's some future work we're currently working on. Thank you. And any questions? Yeah, let's uh, thank Corey. And uh, yeah, open up the floor for questions. Um, I have a question, uh, yeah. just real quick. So you were talking about how you um, upper bounded the spectral radius of your backtracking matrix. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that upper bound is like tight? Like, do you have like an example graph that meets that? Um, or do you think it's actually, it could be, you know, um, it is probably the upper bound is probably lower? Um, so I don't know how tight it is. We have seen some We've seen some graphs where it is relatively tight um, in the loosest definition of the word tight. Um, <laughs> they're relatively close to each other, but um, we haven't examined enough to really see how, you know, if we throw in some more crazy graphs, is this going to get farther away or not? Um, yeah, but so we with, have, the, with the like kind of tight example, is it like a, a special graph or is it just like a random graph? So they, they were on some random graphs. So it, it's equivalent. It turns out it's equivalent in their deregular case. You get that they're equal to each other, gotcha. which makes sense from yeah. the original thing that was proven with deregular graphs. But um, we've just done some random graphs where we've seen that they're relatively tight. And we found that it's consistently tighter than like just bounding it by the using like the maximum degree. Um, minus one. It's it's gen or we've every time we've done it, it's been tighter than that, um, at least. So it's an improvement. I don't know if it will be improved on later, but yeah. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions for Corey? All right. If not, let's thank him again.